Welcome to Free Thoughts, a project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Today we're talking about what it's okay to buy and sell. Some things strike us all as totally fine, like books and cars and houses. But even the thought of money for other things, like love or organs, makes many people uncomfortable or even angry. This commodification has become a hot topic recently, both in popular and philosophical circles. Commodification is a controversial topic and sometimes an upsetting one. But Free Thoughts is about exploring ideas, even controversial and sometimes upsetting ones. Still, it's worth noting that nothing expressed in today's podcast necessarily represents the views of the Cato Institute or its scholars. Joining us to discuss it is James Stacy Taylor, an associate professor of philosophy at the College of New Jersey and the author of Steaks and Kidneys, Why Markets and Human Body Parts Are Morally Imperative, and the forthcoming book, Toxic Trade, An Unapologetic Defense of Universal Commodification. Welcome to Free Thoughts, James. Thank you. It's good to be here. So I think it is the case that most of us have a sense that there are some things it's just not right to trade for money, that we get this kind of yucky feeling at the at the thought of it, but that at the same time, many of those things we have no problem giving away or exchanging when money's not involved. So what's what's going on there? Is it money that makes this an issue or is it something yeah, else? So I think that it is the case that money is the issue. There's many things like kidneys that people are willing to allow us to give away, but they get uncomfortable and perhaps feel it's morally wrong to buy and sell these. And I take issue with that. I think it's perfectly morally permissible to buy and sell many things that currently we currently have prohibited markets in. And there's a lot of discussion currently in the philosophical literature about this. Uh, Michael Sandel has written a popular book called What Money Can't Buy. But there have been other philosophers who have written more serious works. And is it the case that mostly it's their criticism that it's money that is the object here? And therefore, inequality or something else is, is yeah. Going to be mostly, treated. mostly the worry is that money is somehow infesting areas in which it ought not to play a role. So Sendell has the worry that prisons, for example, are allowing prisoners upgrades who can afford it. And Deborah Satz, who's also written on this issue, is concerned that money is playing certain moral roles, but it's not that are not appropriate for money to buy to play. So is this would this be some of their like Michael Walter's work on spheres of justice? It's it's separ- it's uh, two spheres that should be mixed away with each other. So if you make a lot of money in one area, it shouldn't determine your placement on the organ yeah, transplant list. That's exactly right. And something else should. Yeah. yeah, and quite a few people are concerned that money is going to allow the rich to gain access to certain privileges or goods that are denied the poor. And my view is that might be true. It might be the case that if you allow an organ market, for example, then wealthier people are going to have perhaps preferential treatment. But I think that what's overlooked in most of these discussions is that if you allow goods to be commodified, which are currently we're only allowed to give away, many more of those goods are going to become available and it's going to be much better for everybody, for rich and for middle class. So in, in terms of organ markets, is that would that be where the argument mostly lies that none of the current none of the current method, methods of distributing organs, I guess we could just call it distributing, whether it's donation or presumed consent or mandatory consent, none of those methods increase the supply. Right. None of those methods are actually very good at increasing the supply at all. And at the moment we perversely have a price cap of zero on organs. And if you think of what price caps are going to do to the supply of organs, this is manifestly perverse if we really want to secure more organs. So imagine we have a price cap of zero on burgers. The number of burgers that are actually procured is going to collapse. There will be a few burgers which we get because some McDonald's managers or Five Guys owners might voluntarily and altruistically give away burgers. But that's going to be a tiny compared to the amount of burgers that become available now. Could one come back and say that maybe there are certain things that we don't want to increase the supply of, like that if selling them would increase the supply, that's not necessarily a good thing. So 
you know, buying and selling love, like you know, buying buying mail order brides or whatever, it, we might just say, look, that's not the sort of thing that we want to increase the sale of, or children, or prostitution, um, or or even organs. That that it's if more people were giving up their organs in exchange for whatever, that wouldn't necessarily be a good thing. I'd have to hear more about why it wouldn't be a good thing. Organs are the easy case for me, because obviously. If we increase the supply of organs, we do two things. We help people who need organs. We either save their lives or we rescue them from the debilitation of dialysis, if it's a kidney. And we help the people who are selling the organs. We might not necessarily rescue them from poverty, but we'll certainly make their lives better. So are you saying that this this feeling that seems to be, you know, whether it's specific to organs or people have this feeling about a number of different things, that it's it's – just irrational and we should kind of set it aside entirely and get on with the buying and selling and increasing supply? Or or does that feeling represent – is there something going on there that's legitimate and worth examining even if it's not enough to prohibit actual buying and selling? I'd like to give two answers to that because I think it's going to depend on the good that we're talking about. So I certainly don't think that the objections to commodification are necessarily irrational. I think that they – some objections are, I think, misplaced, but they might be philosophically persuasive, like the idea that people might be coerced by their economic situation into selling something they otherwise wouldn't wish to sell. And so if we allow markets in, say, kidneys, then the poor might be economically coerced into selling kidneys. I think that argument actually fails, but I don't think it's an irrational argument for people to make. So I think that first off, we have to look very carefully at all of the arguments, both pro and con commodification, and only then make our decisions. The second response that I would give when you asked about people's gut feeling, there I think it might depend on the type of goods sold. So whereas organs are an easy case for me to make, relatively easy case for me to make, something like prostitution might be a little bit harder, because we might have a view that engaging in prostitution is unlikely to lead one to a fully flourishing human life. And so we don't want to legalize prostitution and encourage its commodification because that might encourage people to engage in a life that is less than fully flourishing. Sort of an Aristotelian objection there. But we could talk about money. I'm interested in partially what is it about money that makes this different? Because there are many things where you could – I mean economists like to get sort of I guess provocative about markets and everything. Right. If we don't if we don't pay money for something, we're paying in some other way. Right. Waiting times on organ yeah. transplant lists or whatever. Exactly. And so so what is it about money? That's one that's always got me me interested. I think partially it might be related to the fungibility of money to some extent because people can take money and do things with it that you really don't like. They can buy hundred thousand dollar bottles of champagne and smash it on a ship or, or or just throw it in the air and shoot it with a shotgun as opposed to giving it to help the poor. Would that is that part of you think maybe possibly why people don't like money being in play here? I think I think that's right. And I think that the fungibility issue is at the core of some of the objections. But I don't think that it's people are worried that you'll just use the money and waste it or misuse it. I think the worry is that if you allow certain things to be traded for money, like love or sex then it's going to devalue the thing that is being traded. And organs, I think, are a good example of this because sometimes people say, well, if you allow organs to be sold, you're putting a price on persons, you're putting a price on people. And some people who are opposed to organ markets even go as far to say this is essentially tantamount to slavery. Mm. The anthropologist Nancy Shaper Hughes at Berkeley flirts with this issue in many of her publications. And I think that approach is completely misguided. I think that if we're really going to allow people full human dignity and respect their ability to make choices for themselves, what we should do is provide them with money because Mm -hmm. then they can make choices for themselves as to what to do with it. I think fungibility is wonderful, not something to be sneered at. Mm -hmm. So in in your book about organ markets, you specifically – work within the rubrics of medical ethics to to make the case, right. not within libertarian market theory or, or anything else just to say because medical ethics has always been interested in autonomy and, and different types of, of self-direction within your own preferences and desires and you think it's it's morally imperative, uh, not, just, not just a good idea but actually morally okay, imperative. Absolutely, yeah. If we take the twin core, the, the twin values of contemporary medical ethics seriously, 
personal autonomy, self-direction, and human well-being, we can make very quickly a very good case for organ markets. If you allow markets in human organs, you're allowing the would-be sellers the opportunity to direct their lives as they see fit, sell a kidney if they so wish. And you're allowing would-be purchasers the opportunity to direct their lives as they see fit, buy a kidney, and then essentially live afterwards. So I think autonomy supports kidney markets, and well-being clearly supports kidney markets as well. The would-be sellers are securing something they value more than their kidney, and the would-be buyers are actually acquiring kidneys to live. The the example of kidney markets or organ markets in general has that feature that I think sets it apart from a lot of other commodification issues in that it's often a matter of life and death for for the buyer. You know, what we're saying is like because we think that selling organs is morally problematic, we are willing to let people die. Um, and if we let them, you know, the buyer wants to live. But a lot of the commodification issue, you know, you, you talk about I mean, your next book is subtitled Defense of, of Universal Commodification. So talking about things beyond organs and things that may not have such high stakes. And so are there areas where the stakes are much lower, but you still think that we should buy and sell things that we're not buying and selling now? Sure. Um, votes. Okay. I think we ought to be allowed to buy and sell. Some people might say we already do, but they'd be wrong about that. <laughs> the campaign finance issue. but. <laughs> Uh, specifically being able to like, you want to vote twice, James, here you go, five bucks. Absolutely. And yeah. Literally the buying and selling of votes. And there might be people cringing right now at that very idea. Right. And this could be very practical. We can retain still Australian voting where you don't actually know, others don't know who you were voting for. And we'll just load all of your votes onto a debit card and you can swipe it. And if, you, if you're in California, you can sell your votes on whichever of the 300 propositions are up this week, or you can sell your votes in presidential races and so forth. And what would we get out of that? And would we get we, – we could get a more uh, sort of respectful of personal autonomy democratic system because a vote might be something you should be allowed to sell as a matter of property. And we could also possibly get better outcomes – um, I think would, – would, are both of those way in favor of selling votes, would Absolutely. you say? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that they both would. And I think that the beauty of vote buying and selling would be even people who are generally apathetic about voting might actually now start taking some interest in politics if only to work out who's offering more money for their vote. And then they might start to ask why it's one party offering more money for my vote. Then, of course, political ignorance is a huge problem, and so there are whatever fifty percent of people, if not more, who don't vote. Right. So maybe money will make them interested in who's who's cha- wanting to influence politics. Now, what do you say to the to the idea that only rich and powerful people will then influence our elections? I think that's entirely false, and for this reason. So imagine, Trevor, that you're a diehard Democrat. And the Republicans offer you $10 for your vote. Democrats offer you $10 for your vote. It's pretty clear who you'll sell to. You might even still donate to the Democrats. But if the Republicans started offering you $15, $20, $50, then it's likely you might start to be swayed. So I think if we had a market in votes, to answer your question directly, it won't simply be a matter of somebody extremely wealthy being able to corner the market. Because depending on what their policies are, people are going to be more or less likely to sell to them. Extremely unpopular policies will have to pay a lot of premium to secure votes. So would that – in order for that argument to work, would that demand a lack of anonymity in vote buying? Because if I have something I want to sell right now and I want to get the maximum price for it, the place of chances are I'm going to go is eBay where I'm just going to put it up, let people bid and – it's an effectively anonymous. I mean, there's a reputation mm-hmm. rating for the buyer, but I have no idea who that buyer is, and I simply don't care. And so, why would voters care who they're selling it to versus just going on eBay for votes and selling it to whoever, whatever random stranger happens to bid the highest? I think that markets in votes would be interesting because people would actually try to secure purchases, would try to push the price down by saying, "My policies are in accord with your values." Now, there's going to be some people who just go on eBay and sell to random anonymous individuals. But presumably, if there's a system whereby enough people are actually interested in the policy, policy is offered and are concerned about that, then the random, random and anonymous markets 
aren't going to tip in favor of anonymous wealthy individuals. Interesting. So can we figure out any sort of commonality between votes and organs that people are cringing that we there are some people out there cringing that we're even talking about this? Is there is there something that we can figure out philosophically to what kind of things those are? I'm not sure if there's any obvious commonality between them. It might just be that people think some things should not be commodified because they're somehow special and that money debases things. It, just reduces everything to the lowest common denominator of a certain amount of dollars. That might be the only commonality that we can find between things as disparate as, say, sex, organs, votes, parental rights, and the like. I wonder if, though, that it seems to me like the one thing that's common between all of those, among all those, is the level of kind of personal connection that we think is present. So, you know, it's, it, that's obvious for selling sex. It's obvious for selling organs. For votes, votes are supposed to represent like your deep-seated beliefs as a citizen of a country and we see citizenship as a powerfully constituent part of who you are. Um, so is it is it that, that there's some things that are so kind of tied to us that it's just it's just not acceptable to part with those for money? You need to have a much better or purer reason. That's interesting, and I think it's persuasive, but at least initially persuasive, because notice that that's adopting a particular view of voting, sex, organs, which might not be shared by everybody. So if I'm just completely apathetic about the political process, and somebody says, you ought not to sell your vote because it's something deep-seated and represents your belief, why couldn't I just respond, no, I just want $5? And is this any different than... Um, other disputes about preferences or values that people have, which in one instance is inherent to the functioning of a market because if two people agree about how valuable something is, they're not going to trade it, right? Right. Um, but on the other hand, when you read the Michael Sandel book, uh, it seems a lot of times like a list of things that, that he values very highly and therefore doesn't think should be sold. And it's 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 hard to suss out whether it's because of inequality reasons or – depriving people of human dignity reasons, but he includes HOV lanes, I think, and box seats at stadiums. And what's interesting to me is that those have some distribution method already. And it's interesting to decide whether or not the traits that let you win in standing in line, for example, to get box seats at a stadium are the kind of meritorious traits that we think should determine the distribution of, of concert tickets as opposed to paying someone to stay stand in line. And is it? I think there's some element of merit there. We we think that the person who stood in line outside the Apple Store for two hours sort of deserves it in some way. And some guy comes along and says, thousand bucks, I'll take your place in line." Right. And I think that that idea of merit applies to can apply to the voting question as well, because I think what we want, you know, we want to say that if if you're a candidate, that you earned your votes. Um, so you were there was merit involved in you receiving them. You you were persuasive. You had good ideas that you convinced people would help the country or the state or the city or whatever. And I think that that notion could also be related to why people get upset about what they see as the the role of money, not b vote buying, but just money in politics. Mm -hmm. Is that it it corrupts it somehow such that people who really don't merit these votes are getting them. And that's the corruption idea. The the in the more I don't even mean in the, in the technical sense of political corruption, but tainting, and, and that, that, like that money is is somehow disgusting or in, in taints areas. I don't know if you would agree with that or not. No, in fact, I would go the opposite direction. I think that your comments about merit are, I think, they're well placed, and I think that people do think that politicians ought to earn their votes through good ideas or good policies. But I think that has implicit within it a premise which I would completely reject, namely that people who have money, even very wealthy who have money, it somehow fell into their laps like manna from heaven. But it strikes me that in most cases, people who are wealthy, even middle class people who are successful, or even the very wealthy like Bill Gates, have secured their wealth precisely through being meritorious in a particular way. They're producing a good or a service that a lot of other people actually want to secure and they're willing to exchange money for. So if we think of standing in line as being meritorious, that strikes me as less meritorious than your hypothetical mm -hmm. person who offers $1,000. 
a guy who's standing in line for two hours can do that, presumably, because the other uses of his time aren't particularly valuable either to him or to anybody else. Mm -hmm. The guy who's got $1,000 is wealthy enough to do that because he's provided goods or services to other individuals. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're concerned about goods being distributed on the basis of merit, we ought to be having markets in goods well, it'd be interesting. rather than not. It would be interesting to know, ask someone who was against uh, commodifying a place in line um, if it would be – so if a man went out and dug ditches, uh, you know, worked really hard on the farm or something and got $1,000 and then immediately turned around and walked to the first guy in line and gave him that $1,000 and then another guy traded hedge funds – so, something inscrutable and kind of bizarre, and he took he got a thousand dollars from that, and went to the guy in line and offered him a thousand dollars. I think there are people out there who would think that the man who worked hard to for the money to pay that person, you know, he, he's like, I didn't have time to stand in line, but I had time to dig ditches and then give you this money that maybe he he deserves it more in the transaction uh, because of this idea of, of valuing a certain type of work. Would, would, you, uh, would you agree with that maybe people out there would think that? I, I, have you seen that literature at all? I haven't seen that in the literature. I can see that there <laughs> might be some sort of appeal to that view. But again, it strikes me as rather odd in that why should earning $1,000 from digging a ditch be in any way more meritorious than earning $1,000 working as a hedge fund, hedge fund manager? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, you don't have to pay them a thousand dollars. Someone else does, and, and that's right. the transaction. So endorsing markets in general, uh, whereas when people trade money with other people for things they think are worth it, is is generally something we should be promoting. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that people with different preferences will be doing things with their money that you don't like, right. and you might have to just accept that. I would say. Um, but if we get down to voting and other possible markets, we had organs. Um, uh, any, anything else that you see in the literature, uh, places where you think markets would be helpful, could be feasibly helpful um, or things that people are very upset that there are markets in now um, on either side of that? There are people who, who write about how markets should not be allowed in certain areas. I think medical research, compensating people who engage as essentially guinea pigs, there's a lot of discussion as to whether or not we should use compensation or payment to encourage people to do that. Mm. And it strikes me that we should be compensating people to do that. Mm. And that probably the same argument there about whether or not we're exploiting the poor, right? And and that's a, that's a, that's an idea that is always present in discussions of free markets in terms of of poor having no other options. And and you mentioned that a little bit. But would you flush out uh, why you think that argument is not very valid? Sure. Um, I don't think it's a legitimate argument because it's false. And normally when we start off discussions of exploitation, we have the example where you're drowning, Trevor, I've got the only life belt, and I say, give me $10,000 for this. That's presumably a paradigm case of exploitation. You really have no other option. But it seems that when we're talking about market transactions, Markets are the paradigm case of providing additional options to people rather than closing them off. So a nice example of this can be taken from an article which was written by Madhav Goyal called The Economic and Health Consequences of Selling a Kidney in India. And this article is very much not in favor of kidney markets, black markets and kidneys in India. But it does show something really interesting he was able to find in Chennai, India, only around 300 people who'd actually sold a kidney out of all the hundreds of thousands of deeply impoverished people in this teeming urban metropolis. That seems to show that people in the economic situation who are likely to sell a kidney in India have plenty of other economic options. They're probably not palatable to us in the West, but they could become beggars, street vendors, fruit pickers, or kidney sellers. Very few of them become kidney sellers. But does that, the fact that there are only 300, cut against the argument in the other direction? Because if only 300 people sold a kidney, then it really didn't budge the needle in terms of how many people were getting kidneys. And so markets don't seem to have had much. Well, 300 people got kidneys. That seems to be. Sure, that, but out of, that's, out of, see, that's out a good of how many? <laughs> right. You know. That's because the marketing kidneys in India is illegal. Okay. 
right? So this is a black market and there's significant penalties for being caught trading in kidneys. And you don't want to sell a kidney in India because black marketeers won't pay the full amount. They won't provide you medical care afterwards. Better example for the argument that markets in kidneys will generate a lot of kidneys is actually Iran. Iran's a beautiful case because they legalized kidney markets in 1988. By the year 2000, they had cleared their waiting lists of people who needed a kidney. And now they actually have waiting lists the other way. People are queuing up to provide a kidney. Wow. And and has the medical establishment, the medical bioethics establishment condemned that? They've condemned it with varying degrees of condemnation. <laughs> so some people, especially transplant surgeons that I speak to, say this seems to be the way forward. Maybe we should have more regulation than Iran has, but we certainly should allow this. Other people, typically academic bioethicists, have said, well, clearly these people are exploited or coerced or forced and so forth. Have we found um, – well, kidneys, of course, you only have one you can give. But we see and you can – I think you can buy uh, blood – you can buy blood and bone marrow now and, and well, after an IJ case that dealt with that. Only things that are considered uh, reproducible – uh, in your body that your body produces again. That's currently the state of the law, more or less. Right. I'm not sure about bone marrow because I think there was a decision about a, a week ago which p places the status of that case on hold. So I'm not really competent to talk about it, about it at the moment. But certainly plasma is bought and sold in the United States. And plasma is another terrific example of why markets are just wonderful because the United States exports a large amount of plasma to many other countries, including Canada, which is currently having a very vociferous debate about a proposal to open a four-pay plasma centre in Toronto, Ontario. Canadians are deeply unhappy with this and conveniently overlook the fact that a significant amount of their plasma now is imported from the US and is from paid donors. And so the interesting question I'm sure they're debating about having people become, you know, poor people become plasma uh, farms going every week or so, which happens. Uh, I, I had a friend in college who, who did that a lot, sold plasma consistently, but he had the option to do that. Um, as you said, you, the options are increased. They're not limited uh, by giving them the, the market ability. Let me ask then about another renewable resource that people want, um, which would be children. I mean, does this do these same arguments apply? I'm not sure those will be renewable so long as. <laughs> well, I mean, we can make one person can make more of them, right? You know, it's not it's not the kidney thing. You can, you know, there's a, there's going to be some cap yeah, they on how can many be can generated. Produce. They can be rather generated, than yes, renewed. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I mean, would that would these same arguments apply to that? That would say, look, what we ought to do is open up a market in babies, and people can get pregnant and sell them over I, and over and over again. I think the better way of putting it is a market in parental rights. Right. Yes. Yeah, I think that's that's a wonderful idea. And I think that would be something that people on the traditional liberal end of the spectrum should favor. After all, this is a wonderful example of women's autonomy, of women having a particular niche market that they can really dominate and exploit. And if you're more conservatively inclined, this strikes me as opening up the opportunity for persons opposed to abortion to be able to step in and say, if you don't abort but carry to term, will pay you X amount of money for the fetus and child to be. And of course, they currently you have you can, there's a lot of ways that people can spend a lot of money to try and get children who can't get them through natural means. So, already, I mean, we always have this concern about preferring the wealthy, right? The inequality of distribution that will develop from this, and uh, that's one concern. The other concern is that a Fagan will come along and, and buy all the orphans and and have turn them all into pickpockets or. Or whatever uh, we can address that later, <laughs> but in terms of uh, in vitro fertilization, which costs a, a good amount of money and definitely privileges the the rich in that area, uh, just getting an adoption can cost a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. People might be uh, again cringing at the idea of markets and parental rights, but again, the idea of whether or not money devalues something is is what we're talking about, and whether or not the total outcome of people who don't want their kids. And, and maybe would be willing to give them to someone else who would give them a better home. Uh, and, and of course, the parents, sort of like the vote buying thing, the parents would have the ability to decide whether or not they want to sell. So they wouldn't. Someone wouldn't come along if if a 
Fagin comes along and is twirling his mustache and saying, oh, I would like your child, um, they'd be like, I'm not going to sell them. But if a really nice family comes along and says, we, we definitely want to give your child a good home, then they can make that choice. Right. And I think that questions of Fagin's going around and acquiring child gangs by purchasing children – that's highly unlikely to occur, and we have legal restrictions mm -hmm. against that. Those anyway. are already against the law, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have children, we have voting, we have organs. Can we think of anything that shouldn't be commodified? I'm having a hard time thinking of anything that shouldn't be commodified. I can think of things which can't be commodified. Mm. Such as? So friendship. You can't really buy friends. You can buy people who might behave like your friends, but you can't really buy true friendship. So I think we can't commodify friendship. So that's interesting, actually. I like the friendship example may point us toward a, trying to dig into people who are against commodification because in friendship, it actually perverts the concept. It's antithetical to the concept and you won't actually get more supply. So neither of those conditions that we're right. we think come with commodification – You'll get more supply of people wanting to hang around you and maybe, I don't know, LeBron James or someone has a retinue of people who hang around him. But that's not friendship um, and people understand that with uh, – but organs, that they are, it's not diminished. It still saves a life if you purchased it and you can increase supply. So friendship would be something that money does pervert. So I can completely understand that. I'm not so sure that organs are perverted by commodification or not. Or children, for that matter, but is is it is it slavery to to even put a price on people in some way? I don't see why it would be. So we have insurance, differential amounts of life insurance for different people, and if you're say an actor, presumably you're going to have higher insurance than a philosophy professor. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that I'm somehow enslaved because actors have higher insurance amounts than me. Presumably the horrors of slavery is because you're treating people as property mm -hmm. and you're bending them to your will. So rather than saying that markets enslave, markets seem to liberate. It's the prohibition of markets and the prohibition of voluntary transactions that isn't slavery, but it's sliding towards that end of the spectrum. Mm. I think a worry that a lot of people have about buying and selling all of these things is is not just the the effect it would have on the seller, that it would incentivize sellers to behave in ways they wouldn't have otherwise and might later regret or whatever, but the the fact that when you introduce money into any sort any any area, it it somehow cheapens it or coarsens it. Um, and so it has negative externalities. It it makes it makes society worse if we are all like actively putting price tags on each other. Is there – I mean is there anything to that or is it just – look, it's voluntary exchange. Well, you mentioned prostitution. Would you see you have see a better case for than organs? And that, is that tied to, to that sort a of – A better case for not for – For prohibiting uh, selling sex than prohibiting selling organs. Right. Prostitution, I think you could have – it's going to be a harder case to make and that the good being sold isn't going to be life-saving. It's just life-enhancing. But I'm not sure that that in itself would show that prostitution should be prohibited. It just shows that it's not as easy a case to make as, say, organ sales or plasma sales. And I think that if people choose, voluntarily choose, rather than a trafficked or coerced, voluntarily choose to go into prostitution, then that should be their choice. And if you don't like it, then I think you can try and persuade them argue with them, maybe even offer them incentives to get out of prostitution, perhaps and buy community college courses or buy them entry or, buy, or pay for tuition at any college of their choice. Mm -hmm. I think some people would definitely quick though at the, at the use of the word voluntary. There, there are people who think that no one would voluntarily go into prostitution. Right, because it's so generally unappealing to most people. Mm -hmm. But I think that First response is there might be people who have very different tastes. So there's a whole range of interesting sexual tastes that people have, some of which are really quite revolting to most people. And yet the people who pursue them have show every indication that this is exactly what they're interested in. So it might be that some people went to prostitution 
do it because they enjoy it. More likely, the majority of people do it because they see that it's their best economic opportunity. And it strikes me that prostitution, like other types of unpalatable trade, that is unpalatable even for the people who are pursuing them. The response isn't to take away their, what they perceive to be their best economic opportunity. For a correct response is to try to alleviate the poverty mm -hmm. that they're in. Well, that often seems to be the case that poverty is the problem. And, and when you – I see a lot of – it appeals to me. I understand the, the objection that these people who work horrible jobs and horrible conditions – uh, have f be have few better options than that, and and I think it seems strange to therefore cut off one of those options uh, when you make this observation about their status in life, and then and then make illegal one of those op few options that they already have. When it seems like what you're actually having a problem with is poverty, which is what we all should have a problem with. Ch you know, child what labor exists in states of poverty. Uh, child prostitution often in states of poverty. It's poverty. It's the problem that creates the seemingness, the seeming lack of voluntariness in the in the transaction. But do we need to define voluntary in some way to to support markets in some of these things? Do we have to have a, a good definition of it? Sure, and I think a good definition will be a person acts voluntarily if her actions stem from her will rather than the will of another individual. So, so we want the conditions are sort of irrelevant in that situation? Uh, sure. I think that they are. But I think that they're relevant in this, in this respect. Person's autonomy and person's voluntariness can be of different values depending on the conditions in which they're in. So if you're middle class in America and you're extremely fortunate and if you're able to use your will to pursue your life pretty much with a wide range of open options – if you're impoverished living in the slums of India, you might still be voluntary, but your voluntariness is going to be less valuable to you simply because your options are curtailed. But again, I think the response to that isn't to curtail people's options yet further. Mm. Instead, it's to try to open up their options. And give them more abilities to get out of poverty. Absolutely. I think one thing that it strikes me may be kind of important to put out there is that a lot of the... A lot of the objections to opening up markets in these various areas seem to be that, you know, the, the markets will then explode in them. That if we if we open up markets in selling votes or selling organs or whatever, then everybody's just going to start selling them all the time. But that's I mean that's not necessarily the case. That if these feelings of aversion that we already have are still there, and there's no reason to think that just making things for sale would change that, then people aren't going to be as willing to sell them in the first place. Like just because you can sell something doesn't mean you're going to. And if fewer people are selling them, then you know it's, it's going to be harder to buy them or the price to overcome that yucky feeling is going to be so high that buyers aren't going to be interested in the first place. So I mean I think that we always have to kind of recognize that there's that check, that if we have a strong aversion to something and it's at a societal it level, then, yeah, then even <laughs> opening up markets isn't going to change much. Yeah, legalizing prostitution would make some some people on the margins, I guess, OK with prostitution, but you wouldn't greatly increase the supply of prostitution by legalizing it because those feelings that are animating this entire discussion – Or necessarily demand. Or demand, yeah. Those feelings that are animating it are, are still there. Even after you you put markets in them, it just there's just more respect for autonomy. And I think that, I mean, what have we learned in Iran you, in terms of the kind of people? Has there been any studies on the kind of people who were selling, who have been selling organs in those markets? It tends to be people who are poorly off. Mm -hmm. But what we do have some anecdotal evidence of, and of course, anecdotal evidence we can take it for what it's worth, is that now people are. Try, who are potential kidney sellers are actually seeking medical care and trying to document that they've received some type of long-term medical care, routine checkups and the like, mm -hmm. so that they can get to the head of a line of kidney sellers. Mm, interesting. So like Carfax, you make, make yeah. sure you have all it's the documentation. You have kidney your, facts. Yeah, yeah. Except kidney facts. That's interesting. And and so I think that, you know, to sort of close that the, the bigger issues that we have with – people have with markets, um, some of those have come – and it's the same discussion when we have questions about um, wild animals and nature, uh, I think. 
and uh, especially endangered species and poaching. This happened all over Africa of people having the ability to buy and sell something that they think is owned in common, um, which was never alleviated by prohibitions on poaching. Um, again, a same type of idea that money taints and therefore uh, perverts something that is more valuable than money itself. Uh, and that caused a lot of problems in Africa and we, and we fixed some of those by allowing markets. We, you can go hunt an endangered species now for a fair amount of money, which means that they use that money to, to for animal husbandry for keeping the endangered species alive as opposed to saying it's owned by everyone. So allowing these rights and allowing these uh, these transactions to occur can make everyone happier, even people who love these animals. I think that's a general lesson we can learn from markets. So let me just ask, There's there's been a lot of philosophical writing about commodification and my sense is the bulk of it has been against commodification one form or another. Um, but you've been pretty dismissive of the arguments in general. Are there any arguments against commodification generally or in specific areas that you think are – I mean if not ultimately persuasive, at least the best. powerful enough to spend some time with? Sure. Um, I think that – Arguments offered by Paul Hughes, who's at the University of Michigan, one of the branch campuses, are persuasive, at least initially. And Hughes' argument is, with respect to kidney selling, that if we're genuinely concerned about people's autonomy, we ought to prohibit kidney markets. And his reasoning is that there are certain options that people have, which he terms constraining options. But if people pursue them, they're going to be less likely to be able to use their autonomy in the future. And his view with, say, kidney markets, but we can expand it to something like prostitution, is that if you engage in this particular activity, then you're going to be, in kidney markets, debilitating yourself physically, which will restrict your future options. Or if you engage in prostitution, then you'll debilitate yourself socially, and people will be less likely to be willing to hire you into normal mainstream employment. That's, I think, is an intriguing. I think that's an intriguing argument. I think it's mistaken because it rests on the claim that the only thing of value is personal autonomy and the ability of people to have a wide range of options. I think that we might have people who are willing to give up their autonomy for something that they value more. So, if you're say end of a Catholic priesthood, then you close off a lot of options to yourself. And you do so because you want to pursue a way of life that you consider to be best for you. And if you're perhaps a slum-dwelling would-be kidney seller, you might realize that overall your options might be closed off, but you might, might want the influx of cash to perhaps provide for your children. And I think that people should be allowed to make those options, make those choices for themselves. Sure. I mean, would the, we do this as a weighing? Because we, it seems like we're also... Or Hughes is forgetting the um, really constraining, autonomy constraining thing is death. Uh, and, and so the recipient of the kidney. Right. Uh, are we going <clears> to <throat> count out how, how much autonomy we have in the equation at the end of the day? Is that what we – should we do that with autonomy? Yeah. This is more autonomy maximizing to a larger group of people or less? Is that how we should make decisions about this? I'm, I don't think that we could, should really do that because it's going to be very difficult to place a value on your autonomy versus mine, given that you might value your autonomy very differently than I do. Mm -hmm. You might, just knowing you, Trevor, this is plausible, you might wish to enter a monastery and pursue contemplation yeah, absolutely, absolutely. and restrict your op options in that way, mm -hmm. whereas I might wish to have a full range of options available to me. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find me on Twitter at A Ross P. That's A R O S S P. And you can find me on Twitter at T C Burrus. T C B U R R U S. And to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.